الحمد لله رب العالمين واشهد ان لا اله الا الله ولي الصالحين واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الى يوم الدين اما بعد uh, today's lesson باذن الله تعالى to me is uh, one of the most important that we've covered thus far it is a comprehensive review of uh, everything that came in chapter one just about. So we're on chapter two today, which is page 66. Uh, and inshallah, inshallah, uh, we will uh, cover uh, approximately half of chapter two today. And then we have another three weeks to go or another three classes, inshallah. Uh, and then we'll be finished the book, bi'idnillahi ta'ala. That will take us to March 2nd, Saturday. March 2nd, which inshallah ta'ala is uh, a pre-Ramadan lecture okay. series at Masjid al-Wasatiyah, a uh, uh, joint effort of United Muslim Masjid and Masjid al-Wasatiyah. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala, I think the advertisement is already going out for that, bi'idnillah. The point though, and I guess that's the point I'm trying to make, is that next Tuesday, bi'idnillah, when we have class, what month is it gonna be? Sha'ban. Sha Sha no, 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 it's Rajab. No. That's Rajab now. A couple more days. Inshallah. Inshallah. So, Friday is the 28th or the 29th, depending on which calendar. And then Saturday, Sunday, could well be the first of Sha'ban. Yeah. And Inshallah, La'alana, uh, yani next week, Bidnilai Ta'ala, we'll just start off by talking about Sha'ban. As a matter of fact, since the topic came up, uh, the Prophet والسلام, used to be diligent about fasting Sha'ban. Uh, Aisha عنها, she said that there was no month that the Prophet وسلم, fasted in its entirety, meaning every single day, except for what? Ramadan. Uh, and there was no month that he fasted more, right? than the month of Sha'ban. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, <clears throat> he said that there are uh, three meanings to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa since we're talking about Ibn al-Qayyim, anyway. So there are three meanings to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam fasting Sha'ban more than he fasted any other month. The first, and this comes directly in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that it is a it is a month between Rajab and Ramadan for which many people neglect. Mm. It's a month that many people neglect. Mm. And when people are not worshiping Allah in general or they're not remembering him as much, it is that time when it becomes actually better to increase in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So think about it like this. What's the Prophet, what did the Prophet والسلام, mention uh, when he came, when he got to Medina? The first thing that Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu an heard him say, and he was not a Muslim at the time, he was still a Jewish rabbi, and he said the first thing I heard the Prophet وسلم, say was what? Ya yu nas afshu salam, spread the salam, watimu hmm. ta'am, feed the people, wasilu al-arham, keep the ties of kinship. And then what? وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ Pray at night when? When people are sleeping. When everybody else is neglecting to remember Allah Azza wa Jal, you pray. So the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal, when many people are being neglectful, is actually better. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ actually mentioned in the hadith of Usama radiallahu anhu. So he talks about why he fasted. So that was the first thing Ibn Qayyim mentioned. The second thing, or the second meaning behind that, is that the Prophet would fast Sha'ban ta'zeeman li Ramadan, as a reverence, يعني showing, uh, glorifying the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to the sunnahs of Fajr before Salat al Fajr. So Salat al Fajr is so important, right, that the Prophet never left off. Praying the two sunnahs before Fajr, even when he traveled. Whereas many of the other sunnahs, Prophet ﷺ will leave off when traveling. But not the sunnahs of Fajr. 
right? And so, <clears throat> because of the importance of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ would proceed it with Sunnah fasting. Because nobody says that fast in the month of Shaban is an obligation, right? So, but it is the Sunnah. The Sunnah to fast the month of Shaban, yani, meaning not the entirety of the month, but a lot of the month. Uh, on that note, uh, in terms of fasting in the month of Sha'ban in preparation for Ramadan, some of the other scholars like Ibn Rajib rahimahullah ta'ala and others mentioned that part of the benefit of that is that a person who is not used to or accustomed to fasting, normally what happens is the first few days of Ramadan, their bodies are getting accustomed to the fast, and so they're not benefiting spiritually as much. <laughs> because it's taken some time for them to get adjusted. Whereas the person who is already accustomed to fasting, that part is already done. They, they don't have a, a learning curve for their bodies. Uh, they've already adjusted to different caffeine intake or ca caloric intake or whatever else is going on. They already, that's done. And so they're able to benefit immediately and from the spiritual benefits of Ramadan. Uh, and the last thing that he mentioned, Rahmatullah is that the Prophet Sallallahu norm was to fast three days of every month. However, there would be months that would go by that the Prophet was preoccupied due to uh, whether it was battles or whatever else was going on uh, in a particular year. And so uh, the fasting in Sha'ban would be somewhat of a makeup for those sunnas that were missed uh, throughout the year. Now, uh, there's a contention amongst the scholars of Islam about the making up of Sunnah fasting, but the Prophet did at other times make up Sunnahs. So there was the one time when the Prophet ﷺ prayed for rakats after Salat al Asr. Hmm. And when he was asked why he prayed those four rakats after Asr, he said that the delegation that came, I mean, some people that came from outside of Medina. Uh, before Salat al-Dhuhr, they uh, occupied him to the point that he wasn't able to pray his sunnahs before Salat al-Dhuhr, the four that he would normally pray. And so he prayed them after Salat al-Asr. So he's making up sunnahs. Okay? And we know that when the Prophet ﷺ would miss uh, Witr for any reason, that he would pray in the morning, but he would make it even. So he would pray 12 rakats at the time of Duha to make up for the 11 that he would miss during the night, if he ever missed the night prayer, and so on and so forth. So the, the point is that that's from the wisdom of fasting the month of Shaban. There are other things that we should do in the month of Shaban, but we'll delay that until next week, and we'll start with chapter 2, where the author, Rahmatullah, is dealing with the secret of As-Salah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the work of the, of the author, rahimahullah, to weigh heavy on a scale of good, ameen, and to bless our teacher for his works as well, ameen. Uh, reading from the book translated, Inner Dimension of the Prayer, on page 66, uh, chapter 2, the secrets of, of salah lies in, the, in devotion to Allah. The secret and the essence of salah is to devote oneself to Allah while praying. Just as the slave should not turn his face away from the direction of the Qibla, he should also disallow his heart from giving attention to anything except his Lord. So when you turn to the Qibla, right? And this is everybody is going to face the Qibla in Salat. That's everybody. Okay? Uh, obviously, there are exceptions to that rule. Like when a person is traveling, he's praying the Sunnah prayers, for example. But in general... Everybody is the same when it comes to facing the direction. But they are not the same when it comes to their heart and facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what actually is going to distinguish the salat. Yeah. Therefore, the abd should let the Kaaba, the house of Allah, be the direction of his body and face. And let Allah be the direction of his heart and soul. Allah shall give his attention to his abd in proportion to the level of his devotion and focus in salah. Thus, if he turns away from Allah by becoming unmindful, he too shall turn away from him 
truly as you judge shall yourself be judged. طيب so uh, change that كما uh, كما تدينو تدان is uh, uh, كما تدينو تدان is the way that it's written in Arabic and you can translate that as you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. Right? So if a person uh, is turning away from Allah Azza wa Jal in the salah, then he should expect likewise that Allah Azza wa Jal will turn away from him in proportion to the way that he turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, this is Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, is giving us a... Uh, an introduction to what is to come. And so the same way that the Kaaba represents the focal point of your physical orientation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, where, where do you actually turn your physical being? You turn to the Kaaba. Uh, Allah is who you turn to with your, with your heart. Mm -hmm. That part Ibn Al-Qayyim is, is laying down for us all right now the next thing that he is going to deal with uh and before i get there uh just just something on this point the prophet والسلام, he said that a person will leave from the salat and he will only leave with the, the reward uh, a tenth of the reward mm. an eighth of the reward or a ninth an eighth and he goes down the prophet and so he says a third of it a half of it notice not even in that hadith that he mentioned that a person is going to get the full reward for the salat uh, perhaps because of the rarity of someone actually actually fulfilling what they need to fulfill in their salat be that as it may is the difference the direction that people are praying in or the direction of their heart? I'm asking again. People praying in different directions, that's what's going to cause them to get a tenth of the salat, a ninth, an eighth, a half? Because they're praying because somebody praying in the opposite direction. They're on 45th Street. Huh? Or what? It's the heart. It's because the heart has lost its focus. The compass is off, Right? And so the Prophet Ali Salatu was uh, mentioned in the hadith, and this is super important, and it's going to come. Uh, in fact, uh, perhaps it's, uh, he'll, I don't think the author is actually going to mention a hadith, so I'll mention a hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that كَانَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَإِنَّهُ يُنَاجِي رَبَّهُ One of you is in salah. يُنَاجِي رَبَّهُ Anybody heard that term before? Yunaji, Munajat? It's in the Quran. Fuqaddimu bayna yaday najawakum. So, what's the. Yeah, what's Najwa? What is it? Like when you're talking to your friend, uh -huh. only between ah. Allah and Tariqahuma. Ah, okay. So, Al Munajat is to talk secretly. Huh? Usually, usually the connotation is that it's with somebody you love. So you're sharing a secret uh, with someone you ahbab, someone that you're close to. Okay, someone that you're close to. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you is in salah, now, pay attention to what's actually being said here. Uh, the the words actually mean like they make a difference, right? So he didn't just say that you're, you're talking to Allah. He said, "In ahadakum you naji rabbahu." Yani, it, you're in this uh, secret conversation mm. with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That's uh, the words themselves are important because you don't do munajat in general. Except for someone with someone that you trust. The whole point of dealing with them directly is you don't want everybody to know. Right? So it's the implication there is automatically that there's a reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you're turning to him 
in submission with your needs, with your complaints, all of that. And also, there's the implication that you love him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because otherwise, there's no munajat. Why, why do you even spend that kind of time with somebody that you don't, that you don't love? SubhanAllah. Tayyip. So now, uh, with 2.1, which is devotion to Allah and Salat, is of three levels. Uh, I do also, if you, if you take some notes in your book, uh, or make note of some things, because the language here gets a little difficult. Um, and mashallah, like the translator seemed to do a, a decent job, but there's some things that I think would make it clearer along the way. So I'm, I'm going to point these out. What I want you to do to write before this is add a question, which is, what is my mindset going into Salah? Mm. All right. So Ibn al-Qayyim now is actually, and, and this is one of the beautiful aspects of this book, is that it's not just theory. He's trying to help us actually take practical steps to make our Salat better. Um, and I personally have benefited tremendously from this exercise here. And be uh, it based on the advice of uh, Sheikh Hanif, inshallah, we're going to do this at least once a year, but a different format, right? So in other words, we'll take it in a condensed form. This will be the long version here, however many classes this turned out to be. And then we just take for example, a Friday night and a Saturday, seven, eight hours, and we just read through it again with minor notes. And, and I actually, after Shaykh Hanif said that to me, I actually heard one of the ulama say this book should be read every month. Mm. And I was like, subhanAllah, so Shaykh Hanif was on to something. <laughs> but on a, on a serious note, like, you know, this is the first thing that we're going to be asked about, yo, Mel Kian. Like, the Salat is that important, right? And so, constantly going over, it makes a lot of sense. And after you get used to it, and you can read it a lot quicker. Like, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it, especially if you can just look at your notes. So, here, what is my mindset going into the Salat? This is what Ibn Al-Qayyim is about to talk about. Fadla. 2.1, devotion to Allah in Salat is of three levels. Devotion in Salat is of three levels. Stop there. So I, w I want you to write Al-Iqbalu ala Allahi fis salat Okay, so Al-Iqbal uh, Devotion is not a bad translation It's fine, but I, I don't know that it captures everything So I want you to understand what Iqbal means Okay, so Iqbal means that you are uh, That you are turning to something That you are devoted to that thing that you are fully concentrated on it, that you're giving it all your, your all of your attention. Yeah. Okay, so this is what iqbal ala anything uh, tends to mean. All right, so you you want that to be captured because if we just talk about devotion, that's not really like um necessarily a word that we're going to use all the time. But if we say turning your attention to, and then there's these three levels. Okay, or uh, focusing on, turning towards. So this, this is what we're talking about here uh, in this particular point. And he, he says that they are manazil, so not necessarily levels, by the way. Uh, let's call them phases or degrees because these are not like, okay, you start here and then you go there and then you go there. No, all three of these need to be happening, right, uh, simultaneously. It's not like one and then the next and then the next. And we got that? All right, so whatever way that makes sense to you to change the language, right? So I would, instead of levels, I would use something like phases and degrees so that I know we're not talking about something that's, that's happening, uh, you know, one after the other. Fadda. So devotion, concentration uh, of the heart. Right. So here, this is actually, he's saying devotion of the heart. This is what it's saying in English. Uh, the author is actually saying giving full attention to your heart. Yeah. So your mindset in the beginning is, right? Al iqbalu. This this is this is what he says. He says iqbalu al abdi ala qalbihi. Yani that a person is turning to, giving full attention to what his heart. It's not the devotion of the heart to Allah. No, it's that you are giving your heart full attention. So. Again, and this is all about how you approach the prayer. 
if you're racing to the prayer, if you if you you know if you're trying to catch the rock eye, if you're doing that part is usually going to get missed. Yeah, alhamdulillah, you may be able to catch up, but there's a difference between starting calm. You're focused on your heart, okay? Khalasa, making sure that uh, inshallah you'll see as he, as he's going to explain. It. Keep going. This level safeguards the heart and rectifies its affairs from the sickness of desires and the whispers of shaitan, as well as all thoughts that may nullify his salah or lessen its reward. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what you're trying to do at the very beginning of salah is get your heart in it, protecting the heart from uh, any shahawat and any shubuhat, any... Uh, whispers of the shaitan, anything that's going to cause the salat to be, or the reward of the salat to be diminished. All right, so giving attention to the heart at the very beginning. Number two, devotion, giving attention, concentration of ihsan. Yeah, so what he says is, iqbalahu ala Allahi bi muraqabatihi fiha. All right, so this is complete turning to Allah. All right. Right. Complete turning to Allah with full recognition that Allah is monitoring his salat. Mm -hmm. So he, he uh, the, the, the translator is equating between muraqab and ihsan. That's mm -hmm. not, there's nothing wrong with that in essence. But what he's, this is an actual action that he wants you to realize. Allah is monitoring this salat. Yeah. What do I want Allah to see of me? Because not only is he watching my actions, because everybody else that can see me, they can see. Or they watching on the camera or whatever. They can see. But Allah is actually seeing the inside as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why you pay attention to your heart first, mm -hmm. because he sees that. Okay? So, with full recognition that Allah is monitoring his salat, hatta ya'buduhu ka'annuhu yara. Yeah. This level is... This level of component is when the abd is mindful of Allah in his salah to the degree that he becomes as if he worships him while seeing him. Yeah, because it's like you feel Allah watching your salat. Nah. Devotion, the concentration of understanding. This level is reached when the slave reflects upon and, and comprehends the meanings of the words of Allah, the Quran, that he recites. And when he contemplates the details of the worship, the salah, in order to pay its due right in humility and tranquility. So, so to summarize what he is saying here, uh, he, he's talking about full attention to the meanings of a law speech. This is, so if we were to think of phase one, what is it? Full attention to your heart. And phase two would be full attention, full cognizance of the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is monitoring that salat. Mm -hmm. And the third phase is full attention to the speech of Allah. All right? it, it, that's the way that I would memorize it. Right? And then you can go back and, and read it and contemplate over what he's saying. Right? Full attention to the heart. Fully cognizant that Allah Azza wa Jal is, is monitoring and full attention to his speech, which uh, two things I'll just say there, inshallah. Ta'ala. It is important that you know what you are reciting in Salat because you can control that. You, you can't control what the Imam recites, but you can control what you recite. And this is an encouragement to learn more of the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal, mm -hmm. to memorize what you can from the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal, and to put it into practice in your salat, in your sunnahs, when you're praying before or after those fard salat, when you're praying at night, when you're praying salat al duha, whatever else that you may be praying, that you learn more of the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this really does go back to... Uh, what what uh, would be called today a worldview? How what you view to be important is based on how you view this world. Mm -hmm. It's based on what you deem to be a, a reality. Is the here is the hereafter a reality? And if you believe it is, then there's a certain there are actions that have to emanate from that. There's a there's an attitude that comes with that. There's behavior. 
And the people who don't believe that they're going to meet a lot, so jealous, or they don't believe that they're accountable, then you see how they're living. There's a certain life that they have. The issue for us a lot of times is that because we are uh, often uh, heavily influenced by our environment and we soak up values and ways and behaviors and attitudes and everything else from the environment that we live in, we don't recognize that that is actually polar opposite of who we are as Muslims. And so we don't, we don't even see what's happening. So we pray the five daily prayers, right? Uh, and we fast the month of Ramadan, but then we, we behave as if we're going to live forever and not be accountable for all the other things that we do. So the, the point here is that understanding Allah's book is not just because a person understands the Arabic language. And many of us are not raised understanding the Arabic language, even the Arabs who are born in this country. A lot of them are not raised like that. Uh, or it's very basic uh, conversational Arabic. It's not something that is actually learned. So they also have to take the time out to study the language so that they can know what they're reading. And, and a minimum practice that somebody can do is whatever you're memorizing, from Juz'ama, for example, just go read it in English enough times, and it's going to start adding up. Even if you don't know exactly which word corresponds with the other word, you know that if you're reading Al-Qariya, Mal-Qariya, khalas, okay, you got a few things there. You start picking it up. You start picking up. And over time, if it takes four years, five years, so what? So what? Well, like, so what? If it takes 12 years, people will take, 12 years, and I'm not talking about 12 years of you studying 10 hours a day. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying if it takes you 12 years of sitting down with the, with the Quran for 20 minutes a day, mm. yes. you know where you're going to actually be in 12 minutes? You're going to be light years behind, be, beyond most people. There are people who take 12 years out of their lives after they graduate college so that they can become surgeons. For what? For what? Seriously, for what? <laughs> for doing it. They, they want to have a certain kind of house. They want to have a certain, they want to be able to drive a certain kind of car. They want to die with a certain amount of money in their bank account. For somebody else to spend. That's the American way. What's wrong with that? It's the American way. It's the way we do things. Hmm? Now, the Muslim is going to come and say, don't you know the hadith aside, Ibn Abi Waqqas? Prophet Sallallahu said, to leave your family rich huh? is better than time out, time out. Go back and read the explanation. Agniya did not mean what we mean when we say Agniya. The wealth disparity, first of all, is ridiculous in, in this country. I mean, this day and age in general. And al Ghani, even in, in the language then, did not refer to somebody who was like, a hundred times richer than, than somebody else. It was the person who had what they need to suffice them uh, for a year. That's somebody that's gonna need. Somebody who has what suffices them for a year is able to give sadaqah, for example. Yeah. Somebody's got 10 homes and a beach house here and a snow house there and whatever else they got going on. Igloos and all oh, nah. If the slave success successfully reaches these three levels or these three components, he will have uh, truly established and performed his salah in the most perfect manner. And in return, he will receive the full attention of Allah. Right. So what he says here, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to rephrase this. So he says, if you fulfill these three phases, if you will, then you have truly established the Salat. And then he says, and Allah's response to his servant matches their commitment. The response matches the commitment. So the more a person turns to Allah, Azza wa Jal, uh, the more Allah Azza wa Jal will turn to them. All right? 
now. That's your mindset approaching what? Yeah. And it's approaching a salat as a whole. Like, and let's just, let's just take a step back. That's beneficial. That's, act, that's practical because you can, at the beginning of every salat, you can just take a quick minute to just think about your heart, know that Eliza Waddell is watching you, and say, I'm going to pay attention to what's being recited in a salat. Like you actually like are reminding yourself, pay attention. Starting with Fatiha. He's communicating. He's having a conversation with Allah. And that starts where? In Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Allah responds. There's munajat happening. All right? Tayyip. That's Salat as a whole. Now, write the next question. What is my mindset for each and everything that I say or do in the Salat. So now Ibn al-Qayyim is going to break it down each, each step of the way. Because that's your, that's your general approach to Salat. And now there's a mindset that you have at every single station. All right? In the Arabic, I actually was trying to figure out how to translate. Because uh, the Arabic is amazing here. Right? He's talking about Qa'im and Qayyumiya and al and like the play on words is amazing, but I just didn't know how to make that happen in English. So, mashallah, we'll <laughs> we'll go with what the uh, translator did because it's good. Alhamdulillah, and then we'll just make some comments along the way. Nah. Two point two point two devotion in salah. The devotion of standing upright before Allah in salah comes into effect when the slave devotes his attention to the greatness of Allah and his attribute of self 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 sub. sub, sub Subsistence. Yes. As this will ensure that he turns neither his face nor his eyes from side to side. All right. Stop there. All right. So when you begin to stand up for the salat, right? So the fir- that's because that's the first thing you're going to do. You're going to stand up for for your salat. This is before you say the tekbir. Okay. You're standing. So what he's saying is that as you stand, think about al qayyum. Because what, what is a person that's standing in, in, in Arabic called? Qa'im, right? Standing. So when you do Qiyam, think about Al-Qayyum, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Because his standing, you, you're going to need. You got you to you push yourself up or somebody got to pull you up or whatever. You are in need of something to be standing. And Allah Azza wa Jal is self-sustaining self-subsisting, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in need of nothing. So as you stand, and you are in need, you are in need as you stand to be balanced to whatever it is, remember al-qayyum, and that he is the one, subhanAllah, there's nobody else that you can turn to except that they are in need of al-qayyum. So don't turn to them. Don't go right and left. And that's what he's saying here. That's going to keep your face directed to the Qibla is going to keep your heart directed to Allah Azza wa Jalla and keep you from turning right and left because you know who you're standing in front of. Nah. The devotion of the statement, Allah is the greatest, Allahu Akbar, by which the slave commences the salah is realized when the slave devotes his attention and focus to his pride, glory, and exaltation. All right. So, all right. A little bit different. So, what what he says here? I'm just uh, nah. So he says, "إذا كبر الله تعالى كان إقباله على كبريائه وجلاله وعظمته." So when he says Allah Akbar, right? Then he is focused at that moment, and this is this is gonna play out later. But when you focus on what you're saying, what is that called in the salat? Khushur. <laughs> That's your khushur. That, that's part of the khushur. But that's how you build it. Because it's total focus on what's actually being said. So when you say Allahu Akbar, you are at that moment thinking about the kibriya of Allah Azza wa Jal. Tell you, what's that mean, kibriya? The greatness. The, 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 yeah. Right. So, so the, actual, the actual translation, right, is pride. Okay. What, it, what does it mean to be proud? <laughs> it 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only bringing this up because I, I think it's important to get a little depth in the words that we use. And I, I honestly, mashallah, I think that that's one of the beautiful aspects of uh, one of the classes that has happened at this masjid frequently, which is the, the basics of Islam. So oftentimes we think about basics of Islam, you know, we're thinking about, okay, how do you pray, for example, but not actually going deep into the meanings of the words that we're saying in the prayer. But just Allah Mu'allima Khaira. What is what is pride? What is it? To be, to be grateful of something that you uh, achieved or Ah, okay. So there's a sense of satisfaction, satisfaction. right? Enthusiasm. About something that that you've achieved, about some accomplishment. Okay, play it. So, somebody said something else? Uh, uh, Tayyip. Is it good to have pride? <laughs> when we talk about that, huh? <laughs> to an extent. Tayyip. Uh, go ahead, tell me. To what extent? Somebody said to an extent. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Bismillah. I think like you can't let it like get to your head, so like it's not necessarily bad to be proud of being like Muslim, for example. Ah, okay. So it's good to be proud to be Muslim, for example. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not mad at you. Uh... But like not like letting it like get to your head where it's like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm the best Muslim or something like that. Uh not letting it get to your head. There's like there's like levels. You, you know what? Subhanallah. If, if that means that I'm grateful to Allah for having guided me to Islam, then being proud is, is good in that sense. That's the type of pride that's going to prevent you from leaving. No. You understand? That's, that's what's going to keep you because you're grateful. So, so there's, a, there's a connection there. And, and subhanAllah, on that note, Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah, he used to say... Uh, Iyaka na'budu. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim said, I used to hear Shaykh al-Islam say this all the time. Iyaka na'budu. Tadfa' al-riya wa iyaka nasta'in tadfa' al-kibriya. Right? So when you say iyaka na'budu, that is repelling ostentation and showing off because you worship who? Allah. And why do people show off? <laughs> take, 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 take a step back. Iyaka na'budu. You're saying to Allah, is you alone that we worship, and you're worshiping Allah and expecting what? Not yet, not yet. What do you expect from Allah? You worship Him, and in the hereafter, what's going to happen? His mercy. You, you can get rewarded for it. And in this dunya, honestly. I mean, there's reward in this dunya and the next. Type, type. Stay with me real quick. So, if you want the reward of your ibadah from other than Allah, then what's that called? That's yeah, shirk. Sure. Some form. Could be major, could be minor, it depends. So, a person who is showing off, what are they looking for? They're looking for reward from other than Allah. Nah, that's it. And that reward is usually an intangible, but like they they want to be recognized, they want to they want people to recognize their accomplishments, whatever it might be. All right. So that when you say ya kana budu, you alone, ya Rabb, that we worship. And that's why Sheikh Islam said Tet fa ardiya. That repels ostentation showing off. We ya kana stain, and it is you from whom we seek. Assistance and aid and help. That repels arrogance. Right? And, and, and a sense of pride. I accomplished. Like you did it all by yourself. Because it wasn't going to happen without Allah Azza wa Jal making it happen. So the point here is that al it in, in, as it relates to Allah Azza wa Jal, we're usually going to use the word pride. And the reason why there's absolutely nothing uh, objectionable about that is because pride does indicate some level of uh, superiority, right? 
or, or let's say supremacy. And Allah Azzawajal is the supreme. He's supreme over all of his creation. And he has the right, he has the right to be proud. In fact, if we can use the term uh, in that sense. Because Allah Azzawajal has inherent majesty and perfection and supremacy over everything. Right? So when you think, when you say Allahu Akbar, that's what's coming to your mind. That kibriya of Allah Azzawajal, that he is the supreme. He is perfect. Hello? Nah. The devotion of the opening supplication happens when the servant extols and glorifies and prays him profusely, ascribing to him all that befits him and declares his transcendence above everything that does not befit him. And he praises him for his attributes and perfection. Tell you. So the devotion of the opening supplication, which is, what is uh, Ibn Qayyim referring to here? No, no, no. no much, uh, before. Subhanak Allah wa bihamdik wa tabarak asmuk wa ta'ala jadduk wa la ilaha ghayru. So the reason why he says here happens when the servant extols and glorifies and prays him because he says Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. So you have at tasbih and at tahmid. At tasbih meaning to declare Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, free of any imperfections, alhamd, which is to declare that all perfections are for Allah Azza wa Jalla, and therefore He is praiseworthy. So that is, again, you are focusing on what you are saying. You're bringing this to mind as you say it that Allah Azza wa Jalla is free of any defect, subhanAllah, that all perfection belongs to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's above everything that does not befit Him. Nah. The devotion of taking, in, taking refuge in Allah from the accursed shay, uh, shaytan is realized by having confidence and faith that Allah shall support him, protect him, and aid him against shaytan. So again, you're focusing on what you are saying. The devotion of reciting the Qur'an lies in the slave's endeavor to learn about Allah through his words, as if trying to see him through his revelation. Right, so... When the person is reciting the words of Allah Azza wa Jal, he is turning his full attention to, and listen, because this part is a little deeper than what we've covered. Because he's trying to tell you, okay, what's, what's your takeaway when you're listening to the Quran? Mm. All right? To know Allah through his speech. This is what you're trying to, this is what you are trying to get at. And this is happening in the Salat. Concentrating, contemplating what's being recited or what you are uh, reciting. Yeah. One of the, the righteous salaf said, Allah manifests himself to his slaves through his speech. Yeah, I mean, the Quran. yeah, exactly. So, it manifests himself. Another way to say that, tajalla, falamma tajalla rabbuhu. So, it, it means to reveal himself. Right. So, Hence the term, what? Revelation. Allah reveals himself through, through revelation. We learn who he is. We learn what he wants us to know about him because obviously uh, there's nobody that can accomplish Allah in knowledge. There's nobody that can know everything about Allah. But Allah uh, blesses us to know certain things about him, some of his names and attributes in order for us to uh, grow in love for him subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship him properly. It is however the case that the degree of devotion while reciting and praying varies from one person to another. And the difference between them is like the difference between the one who's, bo who's both eyes... Yeah, who's, whose eyes are both. Whose eyes are both are sound and no, without unimpaired. The, without the second R. So you would say like this is like the difference between the one whose eyes are both sound and unimpaired. Oh, no. mm -hmm. And the one and, and, and the one-eyed individual, the blind person and the deaf person. In their levels uh, in their levels of perception. All right. So the one that is of sound hearing, sound sight, right? That their level of perception, right? Let, let's just call it that's the highest level. And then you have those that are deaf and blind. And it may be their hearts that are blind. It may, it may not be their eyes. 
right? Their heart instead of lying. There's a lie, as I mentioned in the Quran. So th this, is the, this is the difference between them and their perception in the Salah. No. The Abd should be as heedful as possible to his essence, attributes, actions, commandments, laws, and names. Yeah. The, de the devotion of bowing right, down. So, so far we, cover, we call, covered the standing up position, right? So he started with, what are you thinking about when you're, when you're standing? You're thinking mm -hmm. about Allah as Al-Qayyum. Mm -hmm. And then what are you thinking about during the takbir? And then the opening supplication. And then the rest of the, and then the isti'adha, seeking refuge in Allah from Shaitan. And then the... And then the Fatiha. And then whatever comes, whatever comes after that in terms of recitation of the Quran. And then a person is going to, is going to make ruku or nah. The devotion of bowing down is contained in being mindful to the greatness and the pride of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's, there's that word again. Huh? Kibriyat. Pride of Allah. Allah's pride. Nah. For that reason, it is prescribed for him to say while he is in the state of bowing. Yeah, this is the, the Arabic and the English here, both incorrect. Uh, it's the typo. So the Arabic should say, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. So it says, Allah maja'ani min al Tawabi maja'ani min al Tahiri. That's what the Arabic says there. The English says, uh, Glory to my Lord, the Most High. But it should, instead of the Most High, because that's Al A'la, in, in Rukur, we say, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. So it should say the great or the magnificent. Mm -hmm. All right? And this is why when a person is making rukur, they are thinking about Allah's azamah, his greatness. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. After he rises up from his bowing stance, he should focus his attention upon glorifying and praising Allah repeatedly so as to manifest his servitude to, to him. <laughs> The one in whose hands is the, is the sole authority to bestow and deny. So Allah is the one who gives, bestows, and he's the one who denies or prevents, right? So where is Ibn al-Qayyim getting this from? Why, if a person is coming up from Bukur, he, he says, Sami Allah liman hamida. Where is he getting that a person should be uh, devoting his attention or focusing his attention on glorifying and praising Allah repeatedly and, and recognizing Allah is the only one who gives and prevents. Hold on, Shaykh. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Alright. Alhamdulillah. So that's a, a lot of praise, extolling. Mm. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? The question is so. Each and every step of the way, Ibn al-Qayyim is drawing our attention to where our focus should be. And it corresponds to either the position that we're in or something that we're saying at that particular time. So when you're standing, you're thinking about Allah as al-Qayyum. When you say Allahu Akbar, you're thinking about the Kibriyat. When you're doing the Istiftah, which starts off Subhanak Allahumma bihamdi, you're thinking about Allah Azza wa uh, being transcendent above those things that are ascribed to him. So now, after you come up from the bowing, Ibn al-Qayyim is saying you should be putting that attention to glorifying and praising Allah uh, in abundance, recognizing him as the only one, the sole one who can give and prevent. Father Shaykh. Right. So if if the, well, the reason why a lot of people don't even know that that's a thing is because if the imam did that in salat too many times, people be doing saying subhanallah, like thinking he forgot to go down to sajda. <laughs> nah. So the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, so, so there's two hadith in Sahih Muslim that both mention it. 
One is uh, the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, and the other one is the hadith of Ibn Abbas. Both of them young companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Both of them, uh, well, at least Ibn Abbas mentioned that he used to hear the Prophet say this. All right? So the hadith of Abu Sa'id, and they're both very similar, but the hadith of Abu Sa'id is Rabbana lak alhamd. Rabbana lak alhamd. Mil as samawati wal ard. Wa mil ama shittam in shayim ba'd. Ahl al thanai wal majd. All right, so we're going to stop there for a second. So he said, Rabbana lak alhamd. Our Lord, for you is what? Alhamd. How much praise? That which fills the heaven and the earth and everything after that that you will. Right? Okay? You are deserving of athana wal majd to be extolled and glorified. So he mentioned what? Hamd and thana and majd. Where else are those three things mentioned? And so that's a fatiha. Right. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Hamidani Abdi. My servant has what? Praised me. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Athna Aliya Abdi. My servant has extolled me. Maliki Yomadin. My servant has Majadani. Ahla Thanai Wal Majd. Okay. Ahakuma call Abd. Ahakuma call Al Abd. Wa Kuluna Laka Abd. This is the most truthful thing that a servant has ever said. What? What has preceded? That Allah is deserving of praise, that He's deserving of mm. being extolled, that all praises for Him fills the heavens. And that's why we start off with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. That's why we start off with Fatiha. Mm. Allah Azza will start. Because that's the most truthful thing you can say. Mm. Right. And all, each one of us is, a, is your slave. And then that's when you say, Allahumma la mani ali ma'atit, wa la mu'ati ali ma mana'at, wa la yam fa'udal jaddi minka al jadd. Okay? Oh Allah, there is no mani. Allahumma la mani ali ma'atit. If you have given, nobody can prevent it. And if you prevent, then nobody can, can give it. Wa la yam fa'udal jaddi minka al jadd. Now you say that. Several times a day. What's that mean? <laughs> Everybody say that in Salah? I don't know. Huh? Say it again. Don't you say what Ta'ala Jadduk? At the end of your Salah, after you, after you salam out, don't you? Don't you say, Allah, 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 Okay. All right. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? Well, I am fine. Means what? Does not benefit. The jad, the one who has al jad, meaning he has wealth, he's rich, property. He's well, I am found the jaddi minka from you al jad, his wealth. So, in other words, a person who has something of the dunya. That's not going to deliver him. That's not going to save him from you. Mm. He, can be, he can have whatever he wants. His possessions are not going to deliver him from you. The only thing that's going to deliver him are the mercy of Allah, Azawajal, his deeds, his righteous deeds. Mm. All right? So the only thing that benefits a person, therefore, with Allah Azawajal is, is his righteous deed, mm. not the property that he has. Mm. See, it, which, which, which I think is especially... Uh, for our era, people think that in this country, people think they buy their way out of anything. Right? You got enough money, you could do whatever you want. One of them said, I could kill somebody on TV in front of other people. Nobody could do anything because I got enough money. He was your president at one point, by the way. So the, 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 the reality is, is that people have been conditioned to believe that. <laughs> He thinks his, he thinks his money. This is what He thinks that his wealth is going to make him live forever. Right? They're going to come up with a new discovery. You just got to be able to buy it, and then you can live forever. Yeah, well, it's not going to work like that. طيب. How did we get on that? Mashallah. Okay.
the one in whose hand is the sole authority to bestow and deny. Mm -hmm. So that's the hadith of Abu Sa'id al Khudri, radiallahu ta'ala. And the hadith of Ibn Abbas is very, very similar. But he doesn't say Rabbana, like Al He says Allahumma Rabbana, like Al Ham. So he adds Allahumma. And slightly different, he says Mil as Samawati wa Mil al Ard. Abu Sa'id says Mil as Samawati wa Ard. He says Mil as Samawati wa Mil al Ardi wa Ma Bayna Huma. Wa Mil Amashitta, Min Shayim Bad. Ahla Thanai wa Majd is the same, but he doesn't say Hakuma Kala Ad, Bukuluna Nagad. He doesn't say that. That's from the hadith of Abu Sa'id, the hadith of Ibn Abbas. لا مانع لما عطيت ولا مرتي لما منعت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد طيب When the servant falls into prostration he ought to focus his attention on feeling his nearness to him overwhelmed Why? Why? Why Why is that become the focus? Because the Prophet said something said what? That the closest you are to Allah is when you are in sujood you should be focusing on that nearness that this is when I'm closest to Allah. Nah. Overwhelmed in humility, in the hope that he forgives him, guides him, sustains him, protects him, and bestows his mercy upon him. So there's actually, um, this actually, there was something missed from the translation here. And I thought I put it. Nah. So here, you see where it says, I'm, I'm really sorry to take you off on a journey here, but he says here, he ought to focus, okay. Uh, his nearness to him overwhelmed in humility. Got it? Mm -hmm. Period. Period. And when he sits up, okay, huh? right? He sits in that position that we said was Jathia. He sits on his knees in the hope that what? Allah forgives him, guides him. So he, he missed that part there. Because hmm. this is referring to the jalsa between the two sajdas. And that's when you make dua for what? Allah maghfirli, warhamni, wahdini, wa'afini, warzukni. Right? So that's why he's saying he, he sits there uh, in that position hoping that Allah forgives him, guides him. So nah. Then when he yeah, raises... Yeah, it gets a little tricky, but just go ahead. Well, I'm not going to stop every place. So. Then when he raises his head and adopts the sitting posture, his inner, his inner condition takes on a different nature, one that is similar to the condition of the, of the pilgrim when he performs the last uh, circumambulation. Uh, because at that time, at that point, his heart begins to realize that he is about to complete his prayer and with it leave his, this blessed condition that he is experiencing, and that soon he will be, he will be returning to the, uh, what is that, dreariness? Dreariness? Yeah, dreariness. Yeah. Dreariness is, uh, dreariness of this world, of his, of his, of his worldly affairs, that he, that he had detached himself uh, from just before standing before his Lord. All right, so now, uh, what this, this particular uh, sitting, He's not talking about the sitting that's between the two sajdas. Okay, so the second one where he says here at the end of the page, uh, where he says, then when he raises his head and adopts the sitting posture, he's talking about a tashahud al akhir, mm -hmm. the last tashahud. Mm -hmm. So, what is happening in the last tashahud? The person is recognizing that the salat is almost over at this point. And his condition is like the person who is making tawaf. Al-Wada'. Like he's making tawaf. Al-Wada'. At this point, he knows that he is leaving Mecca. That his rites uh, have, have com been completed and that he's leaving Mecca. And so, when he realizes this, and this is, subhanAllah, this is amazing that Ibn Al-Qayyim is even letting us know that this is a way we can feel. Sometimes, no, really. Sometimes you just need to know that that's an option, right? That, wait a minute, because some people at the end of their prayer feel like, alhamdulillah, it's about to be over, <laughs> right? No, there's a different, that's two different things, right? 
alhamdulillah, I'm about to be able to go back and finish watching the Super Bowl, for example. Allah uh, <clears throat> so what Ibn Al-Qayyim is saying here is that at the end of the Salat, you, you should maybe not feel sad. Maybe that's the wrong adjective, but I mean, there, there should be some feeling of longing for the next prayer, mm-hmm. Right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the seven that would be shaded in the shade of Allah. And he talked about the person who what? قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ Think about that though. What did he say? His heart is attached to the masjid. Mm-hmm. Is he attached to the masjid? Not necessarily. The person got to go out. He's got to work. He's got to he's got to be involved in da'wah. He's got to whatever it is. But his heart is longing to get back to the master, to the master right? And so this is what Ibn Al-Qayyim, that it's that longing that Ibn mm-hmm. Al-Qayyim is talking about because he's feeling a sense of, alhamdulillah, a sense of, my, mashallah, Allah blessed me to, to fulfill this act of ibadah, but at the same time, yeah, I'm about to go back into a whole different realm. Salat is, mashallah, like it's his own zone, right? Mm-hmm. Nah. Once again, he will be subject to, subject to fill. Sub- subject. Yeah, subject subject to, to the feelings of pain and anguish that his heart endured before he started praying, all of which melted away as soon as he commenced his salah. Oh at, this, at that point, his heart rushes to enjoy the nearness, uh, the, yeah, the nearness of Allah for the last time, to bask in his grace and to be saved from the disruptiveness of his worldly affairs. Mm. The feeling... Oh. One second. Um, an hour and what now? An hour and two minutes. Let's finish the page. <laughs> the feeling of bitterness he endures is due to his recognition that all this lasts only as long as he is praying. As this, as at this stage, the heart cannot be cannot be cannot but feel burdened and troubled, knowing that all this is about to end. And that he is about to return to these worldly affairs and concerns. This agitates the Abd to the point that he starts wishing that his Salah were the final act of his life. Not to mention the slave's awareness. Yeah, the, the, that, that's a good translation. Um, the, the way that it's put in Arabic is, is even more profound. Mm. right? Uh, what he says is that to the point that he starts wishing that this was his condition... Until he meets Allah. Mm. Nah. Mm. Not, not to mention the slave's awareness that as soon as he finishes praying, he will resume commen- uh, communicating with those who bring n- him nothing but concerns, worries, and harm after he, had, at, after he had been invoking and supplicating to his Lord. So again, supplicating th- his Lord. Th- this is really hard to capture in the English, but what Ibn al-Qayyim is saying is like, the difference between Salat, where you are now communicating with the one who brings you solace and comfort and rahmah and answers your prayers, and, and, and you know that when the prayer is over, you got to go back and communicate with people who bring you their troubles and everybody got something to complain about and whatever, right? Look at the difference between the two and how the heart should desire the Salat, mm. <laughs> right? No. Nah. However, this kind of feeling cannot be experienced, experienced except by those whose hearts are alive with the remembrance and love of Allah who are cognizant of the negative effect that mankind leaves on their hearts. This is because interacting with people puts him in, a, in the way of harm and worries, agitates his heart, and makes him overlook or miss, or miss good deeds, not to mention causing him to commit more sins. More importantly, it distracts him from invoking Allah the Most High. That's the end of 2.2. So we're going to start at 2.3, inshallah, in the next class. So I do want to comment on this last part because what Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi is saying in the last sentence of 2 is not absolute. It's not to be understood without restrictions. It, he says, interacting with people puts him in the way of harm and worries. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, 
said that the believer who mixes with the people and is patient mm -hmm. with the harm, the, the other. So, وَيَصْبِرُ عَلَىٰ أَذَاهُمْ أَذَا can mean harm, it can mean annoyance, right? Um, the person who mixes with the people and is patient with that, uh, the believer who mixes with the people and is patient with that, is better than the one who does not mix with the people and is not patient with their harm, all right? So, how do we then understand what Ibn al-Qayyim is saying in light of that? Well, change your crowd. So, yeah, the majority of people, depending on what environment you're in, may agitate you, may cause you to miss good deeds, may be the type of gathering that is going to be sinful, but that doesn't, ha that doesn't have to be the case. And even when you mix with people that you share values with, it doesn't mean that it's going to be free of annoyance or of some type of uh, inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Having friends is inconvenient. That's okay, because you inconvenience them too. Mm -hmm. But that's what it means to be a friend. It means that you step up at times when it's not necessarily convenient for you, right? But being a friend means you do that. And so you mix with them. The other thing, subhanAllah, even some of the ulama mentioned this and explained in this hadith, is that mixing with the people, you actually can benefit a lot because especially if, you, if you're around people who have good character or, you, or, or they have knowledge or some, something else that you benefit from, you may have a positive impact on them and, and they have a positive impact on you. It doesn't necessarily have to be something evil, but there's still going to be uh, some at a minimum inconvenience, if not annoyance. Because, and you know what, subhanAllah, as a side note, advice to especially, you know, newlyweds, like you're going from a time when you're not used to sharing space with somebody, for example, and now you're sharing space with them. And so there's gonna be some level of compromise. That's what happens. It's like when you didn't have a neighbor and now you have a neighbor. Well, you know, just, there's, there's going to be some level of compromise in that. And if a person is patient with that, then alhamdulillah. But many people, they're like, ah, but this happened and that happened and this was annoying and that's it. But that's, that's what it means to share space with somebody. And you got to get used to each other, right? That, that's just the reality of, of, of life. So here, the same thing. When you, are, when you are mixing with the people yeah, there's going to be some harm in that or annoyance or inconvenience or whatever. But being patient with that, your reward with Allah is, is tremendous. Uh, that being said, what I believe, and Allah knows best that Ibn al-Qayyim here is alluding to, is what he talks about in other places, which is over-socialization. Because right? that kills the heart. You over-socialize. And there is a sunnah from the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, that is meant to recalibrate, to reset from over-socialization. Anybody know what that sunnah is? Yes. I'tikaf. Yes. I'tikaf. Because I'tikaf is meant to do what? You become, you isolate yourself. Uh -huh. As for the anti-calf that you see in certain places where everybody's kind of huddled up together, right? Everybody's doing everything together. Uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of the anti-calf itself. Play. Mm -hmm. Last thing that I mentioned on this, I want to mention one of the uh, uh, one of the scholars in his explanation of Bulu Maram. It's called Badr al Tamam al Maghribi, Rahmatullah alayhi. Oldest, يعني, not from this. Uh, 300, 400 years ago, in explaining being patient with their harm. He mentioned the beautiful point, uh, and I just want us to ponder it. He says, Al hadith fi dilala ala fadila to sabr. Wa al afwi an al madalim wa kad mil ghayd. He said, This hadith uh, indicates the virtue of sabr. Okay? So, what sabr is to, 
to have patience, to endure, to persevere. Okay? And وَالْعَفْوِ It also shows the virtue of overlooking uh, the, the wrong. The wrong, somebody wronged you, you overlook. How that's going to happen if you're not mixing with people, right? So that's where you get wrong. And you learn how to do what? You learn how to pardon. You learn that everything's not going to go your way, that people are going to do things right, and you, and you let it go. Well, kev min life. And also to do what? To restrain what? That rage that you have. When do you get angry? When you're sitting alone by yourself? Somebody made you mad? It wasn't. Halas. Sitting by yourself. No, it's happening because you're mixing with people. When somebody did something that just drove you nuts. So you just like, so what do you have to do? You got to rein it in. Like, all of that is what? Practice. It's practice. It's, it's helping you develop a muscle that you otherwise, that you otherwise wouldn't have. وَهَذِهِ الْخِصَالِ إِنَّمَا تَكُونُ مَعَمَنْ يُخَالَةِ النَّاسِ These uh, qualities only happen when somebody mixes with people. وَيَقِلُّ حُصُولُهَا مَعَمَنْ لَا يُخَالَةِ And the person who doesn't mix with people doesn't know how to do those things. And these things are important. They're important qualities. Because whether you want to mix with people or not, in general, you can't just go to the mountain with your goats. You're going to have to mix with people at some point. So developing these qualities are important. They're important that you develop those qualities. Otherwise, you won't have them. And there's great reward in sabr and al-afu and kadm al All of that has a great reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. هذا والله أعلم صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك. If you want to read ahead, we're going to finish chapter two next week. إن شاء الله تعالى بإذن الله.